that social relations are, um, are important for health and well being um, and for making different developmental transitions across the lifespan. And so shown here is the row and con model of successful aging, which includes uh, three different components, avoiding health. I had to click that. Okay, um, sorry. Avoiding avoiding disease and disability, high cognitive and physical functioning, and engagement with life. And so this model has been used countless times in um, research on successful aging, and that engagement with life piece is the thing that encompasses social engagement and social networks. So some of the earliest studies about the benefits of social connectedness were actually about mortality. Um, this graphic here illustrates the relative importance of social relations for survival in comparison to other key lifestyle factors. So you can see, um, so the strength of the bar represents, so these are results from a meta-analysis. So uh, it, looked across 148 studies. So that's over 300,000 participants. And um, the, the relative, the size of the bar represents the strength of the relationship between each of those factors and mortality. So you can see here that social relationships are a more important predictor of, uh, of mortality than other factors that you might think about, like smoking, uh, alcohol consumption, obesity. And so findings from these studies suggest that socially connected people live longer. Now, in order to really exploit the protective effects of, um, of these social relationships, researchers needed a more systematic delineation of what exactly is it about social relations that's so important. Now, these early uh, relationship researchers one thing that they did is uh, simply measure whether or not a social tie existed. So for example, uh, marital status was actually used as a measure of social integration, such that being married meant that you were socially connected and in a supportive relationship. But you know, we've since learned, and, and we now know that social relations are much more complex than simply the presence or absence of specific social ties. And so my work, capitalizes on this complexity. And I distinguish between multiple, uh, multiple dimensions of social relations. So in this talk, I'm gonna first provide uh, like an overview, some background of, of what these different dimensions are and different um, key components of, uh, or key tenets of social relations research. Um, and then I'm going to go into a specific study that I uh, recently, worked on, um, on dementia caregivers support networks. And then I'm going to end with a topic that um, I think is very timely on a technology and social relations. So I'll start with uh, the overview. So like I mentioned, social relations are multidimensional. Um, so when, when researchers are referring to social relationships, they could be social relations, they could be referring to social networks, social support, satisfaction with support, relationship quality, social integration, or social participation. So all of these components fall under the umbrella of social relations, and they all have distinct implications for health and for successful aging. Now, my work primarily focuses on social networks. Um, and social networks can also encompass some of these other dimensions. So you might be wondering, how does one measure um, social networks or personal networks? Uh, and here I show a very commonly used technique called the hierarchical mapping technique. So this was based on um, the convoy model. And so with this method, uh, respondents are presented with three concentric circles, as you see on the screen. And they're asked to think about the, their closest and most important social ties. So those are, who are considered um, closest or so close that you can't imagine life without them, those people are placed in the inner circle. And then people who are less close, but still important enough to be included in uh, 
people's social networks are placed then in the middle and outer circles, uh, depending on their level of emotional closeness. And so this allowed uh, participants to sort of self-select who they considered um, to be part of their social network, rather than relying on different um, like role relationships. So, you know, for example, uh, you could use family at, or uh, coworkers. Um, but this allowed participants to make more subjective evaluations for themselves. So based on this technique, participants are usually asked about each network member that they enumerate. And from this information, we can derive measures of social network structure, function, and quality. So different measures of um, structure include things like network size, so how many people total are enumerated, composition, this could include kinship composition, so what is the relative proportion of family to friends or other relationships. Um, it can, we can look at age or gender heterogeneity, um, so are they mostly same aged peers that are included in people's networks or is it more uh, intergenerational? Um, proximity, how far away do these people live? And uh, stability or relationship duration, how long have you known each person? Um, measures of function include things like contact frequency, so how often are you in touch with the people that you enumerate, uh, as well as a number of social support exchanges. So this can include emotional support, um, practical support, who helps you with groceries. Um, and then measures of quality include uh, emotional closeness. So the, the circles themselves can be used as a measure of emotional surface, so, uh, closeness. So placement in the, cir placement in the circles uh, represent varying levels of emotional closeness, um, as well as different emotional experiences. So the quality of your relationship can be positive or negative. Another important thing to consider when, uh, when we talk about social relations and aging is that personal networks or social networks change over time. And many studies have documented that uh, there are some predictable changes across in adult social networks as they age. So here's an example of how an individual's personal network might change across adulthood. So you can see that the inner circle actually remains fairly stable. Um, and that, but in the other circles, the middle and outer circles, uh, you can observe that network members are added, removed, or even change position over, um, over the life course. So typically, um, a number of studies have found that compared to younger adults, older adults report smaller social networks, um, that close, a composition of mostly close family and close friends, less frequent social contact, and less geographic proximity to their social networks. Um, they also report providing less support, but having more satisfaction with their social, social networks um, and less conflict. And so across all ages, but you know, including in older adulthood, supportive networks and personal relationships are associated with a whole host of um, health and well-being outcomes. So these include a stronger sense of meaning, better emotional well-being, better cognitive functioning, as well as better physical health. So when functioning optimally, our social convoy or our social networks serves to protect us against stress. So that's when, when things are going well and relationships are positive and supportive. So one stressor that I wanna talk about is caregiving. So one situation that uh, many older adults face um, as they age or as their loved ones age is informal caregiving. So I'm focusing uh, today on specifically on caregiving for those 
affected by Alzheimer's disease or other related dementias, which I abbreviate here as ADRD. Um, ADRD caregiving is and will continue to be a major research priority due to projected increases in the need for, for informal caregivers, as well as, um, you know, we need more research on ways to support this growing population. So currently about 15 million Americans provide unpaid care for someone with Alzheimer's disease or related dementia. And like I said, this number is expected to rise in the future. Uh, I also mentioned that informal caregiving is often considered to be a chronic stressor. Although I will, I should also note that there's a growing body of literature highlighting the positive aspects of caregiving as well. So it can be a rewarding experience as well as um, a stressful experience. So these stressors range from uh, the direct effects of providing long-term care, like, uh, like the physical toll of caregiving, um, financial burdens that are associated with providing care, um, as well as indirect effects. So this includes uh, interpersonal strains that result from uh, different expectations of the caregiving network. Um, so accordingly, caregivers' personal networks can be a source of support for managing these stressors, but also a source of interpersonal strain contributing to caregiver stress. And in often, in, in many cases, um, both of these things are true. Relationships are supportive and strained simultaneously. Um, another fact about Alzheimer's disease that I think makes it unique is that Alzheimer's disease is heritable. So that means that having a family history of Alzheimer's disease means that you are more likely to develop it yourself. And uh, so family history reflects a really important contextual factor that has the potential to shape caregivers' support networks. So for example, um, in families with multiple relatives diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, uh, family members may have developed a schema for disease progression um, and how caregiving responsibilities might unfold within the family, having experienced it in the past. So in addition, in addition to uh, balancing disease management in their affected relatives, because of the heritability of um, Alzheimer's, Alzheimer's disease, there is also the added anticipation of future caregiving for themselves based on their own increased risk, as well as anticipation for providing care um, for others, in the, for other family members. So like I said, um, this risk of Alzheimer's disease has the potential to shape caregiver networks in terms of both expectations of, of how caregiving responsibilities um, take place in the, in the family, as well as the family dynamics that result from previous experiences of caregiving. So I talked a little bit um, about comp these different dimensions of social networks, and I'm going to uh, now dig deeper into like specific aspects of composition and network function. So caregiver social networks, like all social networks, can be described in terms of both composition and function. So in this study, we focus specifically on kinship composition. So this is the relative numbers of kin to non-kin. So kin includes biological family as well as family by marriage. Um, and non-kin includes friends, healthcare providers, and, and other important people. Um, so these kinship roles often shape the types of support functions that members of a support system engage in. So in the context of caregiving, these functions can refer to specific interactions or behaviors of, um, of the network members in these support networks. And I'm gonna talk about three. So uplift refers to active positive engagement. 
So this includes things like helping with caregiving or showing appreciation for caregivers' efforts in caregiving. Nonfeasance refers to disengagement or uninvolvement with caregiving. Um, so this includes things like when people don't help with caregiving or don't keep in touch with the caregiver. And then malfeasance refers to active negative functions. So this includes being overly critical of, um, of the caregiver or providing unwanted advice. So these are all things that have, um, that we believe to be, that we believe to shape caregivers' uh, emotional support efforts. So I'm gonna share results of um, a study that was recently accepted for publication in um, the journal Research on Aging. So hopefully you'll be able to read the full study soon, um, but I'm gonna provide some of the highlights. So spoiler alert. Um, and so the, the two major questions that we focused on in this study were, um, are kinship tie, uplift, nonfeasance and malfeasance associated with caregivers emotional support networks? And do these associations vary according to caregivers prior family history of Alzheimer's disease? Data for this study came from the CareNet study, which included 71 caregivers of a relative diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease or related dementias. So these caregivers were recruited through um, memory care centers in Memphis, Tennessee. And I say this because I think it comes back to the generalizability of, um, of these findings. So uh, in this study, caregivers with a family history of Alzheimer's disease were oversampled um, by study design. So a family history of prior family history of Alzheimer's disease was indicated for those with at least one biological relative um, with an Alzheimer's disease or related dementia diagnosis in addition to the current care recipient that, um, that they're providing care for. Uh, so we had, so it was almost a 50-50 split um, with 33 caregivers coming from families with a family history of Alzheimer's and 38 without. Um, and some sample descriptives that I will highlight are that this was a predominantly female and white sample. Um, most of the caregivers were married or living with their partner. A little over half of them were college educated. Um, and as for relationship to the care recipient, over half of them were the child of the care recipient or the, the person with Alzheimer's disease. Um, and then 13% were spouses and other relatives included grandchildren um, as well as nieces and nephews um, and, and other relatives. So the mean age of the caregiver caregiver in the study was 65, and the mean age of the care recipient was 82. Okay, so to collect um, network data, we used the hierarchical mapping technique. So that's why I spent so long describing it um, in the previous slides, because I come back to it here. So um, in this study, participants were uh, they completed this network assessment and enumerated all those they considered to be close and important. Um, in addition to their own uh, personal networks, they also reported on family members and other close and important individuals to the care recipient. And so this, this resulted in, in larger um, caregiving networks. So it was their own personal network plus the care recipients that they were reporting on. Um, so participants were asked details about each network member, including kinship ties. So what is this person's relationship to you? Um, and then they completed a questionnaire asking about different network functions. And they nominated the network members that they had enumerated that fulfilled each of these functions. So these functions include um, seven items for uplift, 
four items for nonfeasance and six items for malfeasance. So, you know, who helps you with caregiving? And then they would nominate, you know, all the network members that they uh, believed to fulfill this role. Um, and then the, so I, I mentioned we looked specifically at emotional support networks, and these were identified by selecting those network members that uh, participants reported to provide emotional support. Okay, so displayed here are all 30 family networks um, at the, the top of the screen. So the red represents families with a family history of Alzheimer's disease, um, and then the yellow is no family history. Um, the larger nodes in each network represent uh, the participants. So you can see that there were you know, multiple participants per family. Um, and then the smaller nodes represent network members and the lines between them represent ties. So um, enumeration ties, did they enumerate these individuals? Uh, and I'm showing percentages of Non uh, kinship tie, uplift, nonfeasance, uh, and malfeasance. And one thing that I want to point out is that if you look at the percentage of network that um, was reported to be nonfeasant or malfeasant, these are really these are pretty low compared to like uplift. Um, so you know, nonfeasant ties we're looking at almost nineteen percent in those with a family history of Alzheimer's and twenty six percent. And so that's you know, kind of promising that these uh, networks seem to be pretty positive overall. Okay, so I'm not gonna go into too much detail about the analysis strategy, um, but I will provide some guidance as to how in, to interpret the um, results that I'm gonna show in the next slide. So I'm going to show the results as odds ratios because I estimated uh, logistic regression models. And so values that appear to the, to the right of the dotted line indicate an increased odds of being included in the emotional support network. And values to the left represent decreased odds relative to um, the comparison group of each of the different um, variables we look at. And so uh, the important thing to remember here is that the, anal the level of analysis is at the network member level. So do network are network members who demonstrate uplift more or less likely to be included in the emotional support network? That's basically what we're looking at here. Okay, so um, the findings revealed that network members in Alzheimer in the ADRD caregivers emotional support networks were less likely to demonstrate nonfeasance, more likely to demonstrate uplift, and more likely to demonstrate or more likely to be non-kin um, than those who were not in emotional support networks. So notably, when we accounted for prior family history of ADRD, we observed that the effects for uplift and kinship tie were only observed among those with, with a, a prior family history um, of Alzheimer's disease, but not for those without. Um, but the effect of nonfeasance remi remained consistent regardless of prior family history. And, uh, and then we didn't find any effects in either direction for malfeasance, which is quite interesting. So I'm gonna summarize these findings with three main points. First, it's, uh, it's important to consider prior family history of Alzheimer's disease. So these previous experiences and expectations about caregiving really do shape caregivers' emotional support networks, at least in, um, in the context of Alzheimer's disease. Um, and I think this also points to a need for longitudinal designs um, so that we can study the long-term 
and multi-generational effects of family caregiving uh, and, and caregiver support networks. Um, I think another finding of particular importance is the importance of non-kin ties. Um, so non-kin were more likely to be included in, in the emotional support networks, particularly for caregivers with a prior history of um, a prior family history of Alzheimer's disease. And I think this is important because caregivers often report struggling to maintain friendships, but these friendship ties represent a really important source of support that may or may not be intertwined with the, with the actual caregiving itself. And so I think that guiding these caregivers, especially those that might be pruning or um, reducing interactions with friends uh, to identify social, to identify support sources outside of family um, could be really beneficial to their, to, to caregivers' uh, health and well-being. Um, and then finally, this study provides insight into specific behaviors that, that should be encouraged or avoided. So for example, um, behaviors and interactions on the scale that characterize uplift, like showing appreciation or um, keeping in touch with caregivers, those are things that that could be encouraged um, by, by family members and friends of caregivers, while those that characterize non-feasance um, should probably be avoided. I, I think it's really interesting that um, malfeasance was not related to uh, perceived emotional support. Um, and I think a, a, a strong possibility is that, um, so the way that these were measured, they're not mutually exclusive, you know, so network members can demonstrate both uplift and malfeasance. Um, and so it's possible that network members who demonstrate malfeasance are also engaged in uplift behaviors and are still actively engaging in caregiving. Um, and so we find that it's that disengagement um, or being uninvolved that's that's particularly distressing uh, for caregivers. And almost that, you know, any involvement, even if it's negative, um, and particularly when it's paired with positive is a good thing. Um, and that these, these behaviors also represent potential targets for intervention. Um, and so that's why I think this is a really, uh, these are really great measures because they represent specific behaviors or um, interactions that, that can be targeted. So, in the spirit of talking about interventions, I also want to touch on um, technology and social relations. And even though this isn't my primary <clears throat> area of study, um, it's something that I'm really interested in and I think is definitely going to be increasingly important in the future of, of research and, and in terms of practice and policy. Uh, so yeah, technological advances really fundamentally change the way that we experience social relations um, with the advent of newer communication technologies like texting and, and social media. So these, these new ways of, of staying in touch with people um, have really impacted how we form and maintain our social ties. Um, so here I show some stats about uh, technology usage and uh, in older adulthood. So nearly all adults aged 50 and up use technology to stay connected with family and friends. These stats are from 2017, so they're four years old, and I, I'm sure that it's much higher now, especially in this, you know, post-COVID world. Um, and I, so given that older adults are using technology, I think that these communication technologies represent a really positive avenue for fostering, um, sorry, a really promising avenue for fostering positive relationships and 
um, and potentially delivering social support or social in social integration interventions. Um, but you know, the future future research on social relations really need to consider the implications that these new ways of forming and maintaining ties have on on our um, on our relationships and on our well being. So, you know, there are risks and benefits. On the one side, technology helps to bridge geographic distances so that we can stay in touch with people who don't live very close to us. Um, and this promotes intergenerational ties. So one of the biggest motivators for older adults uh, to adopt new technologies is to stay in touch with younger family members, especially um, grandchildren. Uh, so, and then, like I said, the potential for social support interaction uh, interventions. Um, but you know, there's there are also risks. Like we know that spending too much time on social media has been linked to anxiety and depression. Um, there's the potential for cyberbullying and uh, an ambiguous emotional stimuli um, when you you don't have that face to face timing. Um, like on time interactions. So, you know, overall, it does offer a new way of providing and receiving um, support from people, but it's important to recognize the, the risks also. Um, and I think that there is a lot of great research going on in this area, um, exploring the implications of these new communication technologies on social relations, because the ultimate goal of this research is to allow us to leverage our social ties to improve the health and well-being for people of all ages um, at every point in the lifespan. Uh, so I'm going to end with this quote here that I love. Um, call it a clan, call it a network, call it a tribe, call it a family. Whatever you call it, whoever you are, you need one. So like I said in the beginning, social relations are very complex. The way that we conceptualize them, the way that we measure them is varied, um, but the implications for health and for successful aging are very widespread. And I think it's really important that we continue to study social relationships because this is an inherently adaptive field. You know, As we continue to experience things in the future, um, it, it's going to be, it's, it is crucial that we consider how, um, how these relationships change and in turn, how they influence our health and well-being. Uh, and I'd just like to acknowledge my uh, research groups, both past and present at the University of Michigan, and also my um, current research group, the Social Network Methods section uh, at NIH. And I thank you for your attention. Um, and I welcome any comments, questions, feedback. I'm especially curious as to, you know, what what is what information is useful for you in your practice, um, and and what do you think? What do how do you think researchers can uh, facilitate that more? So I'll leave it at that. Um, I don't know if I should keep sharing my slides or stop sharing. If you want to keep sharing so they've got your contact information down there at the bottom, that would be great. Thank you so much, Dr. Manalel, for sharing this um, very informative um, presentation with us today. And just a couple of things I wanted to comment on is, um, of course, I've been hearing some of this already about Alzheimer's, but uh, for those that were not aware of just this, um, the disease of Alzheimer's disease being projected to nearly triple by 2060 is outstanding, you know, the number of 14 million people in the U.S. and how many more caregivers there's going to be. And so the, your information of how we can support caregivers is so important and you know, thinking we also need another webinar of what are some of the things that we could potentially do to 
change some of our lifestyles to uh, uh, prevent or reduce Alzheimer's or some of the other forms of dementia. Um, we don't have any questions in the chat box. Does anyone have anything? Or Karen, it looks like you unmuted. Did you have a question you want to ask? Well, I'm trying to formulate how to ask and put it in <laughs> writing. <laughs> so during the last 15 months, we have um, caregiver chats and support groups that have been meeting through um, Zoom and using this platform. And so in April, we proposed to the group that we go back to in person. And there was this big pause. And the people that were on that Zoom said, you know, we kind of like doing this by Zoom. And okay. so um, they liked the connection. And so we're gonna continue our caregiver chats. It's once a month and we have a topic of the month. So next month it's on gratitude. Um, this month it was finding your inner strength. But now I'm, I'm struggling with, okay, those are the folks that are in tune to technology and like the support that they're getting from that. So is there any research out there about you know, the in-person and as we gradually go back to some of that? Are there any hybrid model programs out there that you know of? Um, any suggestions of how to connect people so that they build those networks? Yeah, that's, um, I mean, this is such an important issue. And I think being where we are now in, you know, in terms of the pandemic and things starting to reopen, but people, um, people are incredibly adaptive. Mm -hmm. And you know, I think that the way that many of us adapted to shutdowns and social distancing is like really phenomenal. Um, and for many people, it has worked. And it sounds like the people, for many of the people in those support groups, it's working. Um, and, you know, like I said in the last, in my last slide, um, one of the key advantages of these newer communication technologies like Zoom is that ability to build geographic or to, um, yeah, bridge geographic distances. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think the convenience is, you know, of, you know, rather than like schlepping over to some community center and um, and meeting with people, I think that con convenience uh, really speaks to the accessibility of people. But you're right, it it's already a self-selected group of those who are in tune with, um, who are already like plugged in to social media and Zoom and how to use these things. So I don't know off the top of my head of any hybrid models, but I am sure that they are coming into existence. Mm -hmm. um, if you email me, I can find more information for you. So kind of, uh, I wanna comment on the point that Barb made about, you know, Alzheimer's disease and, and caregiving, especially becoming uh, just so, becoming much more prevalent than it already is. Um, in response to these projections, uh, it NIH has made a huge push at getting information out to the public. So there are, um, I think on the National Institute of Aging, so this is not my institute um, that I'm part of, but on NIA's website, there are so many like information guides about um, both preventing Alzheimer's, but also managing it at different stages of the disease. Um, resources for caregivers. And it's, it, it really is a major research priority just in terms of, you know, what sort of projects are being encouraged um, by researchers. So I think it's really, I think the future is bright <laughs> um, in terms of the, the research that's being done because it's, you know, we recognize that this is, this is a priority and we need, we need ways to um, support the people who are taking on this incredible burden um, and ways to maximize the positives of that experience because I did mention that it can be incredibly rewarding as well. Um, I hope I answered your question. Great. 
Thank you. Um, we had someone right in the chat box here. Um, thank you for your presentation. It was very well done. And that she has used the convoy model before uh, and really likes it. Um, and then she continued to write, we just did a technology time program for older adults as technology learners. Any resources that are simple, easy takeaway tips or best practices for older adults getting started with using technology to connect with family would be helpful from researchers. And it sounded like from your what you presented that a lot of the people, I believe you said 50 plus, um, were using technology. I found it interesting. It was more women than men that felt like they were connected. Um, yeah, um, that, that is interesting because we, uh, so in the literature, there's this uh, phrase, kin keepers, that women are, you know, serve as kin keepers in the family, like keeping family connected. So it makes sense that for uh, using technology for that purpose, um, women would be more keen on the uptake. Um, but yeah, I think as for resources to help older adults, I'm sure that they, you know, they, I know that on the, um, there are resources on NIA's website, um, but older adults are using technology. And I, I think increasingly so. Um, and I, I think that the technologies are also becoming more user-friendly, like for all, for everybody, <laughs> um, just because they are so widespread. Um, and, but, but it is important to recognize that there is still a subset of the population that, um, first of all, doesn't have access to some of these technologies. So like internet access, um, might not be as uh, widespread as we need it to be. Um, and so a lot of, I think that a lot of these, a lot of the barriers have to be addressed at a more um, like top down uh, level. And I think probably the last 15 months more people have engaged in technology that maybe would not have if it had not been the pandemic. And, and I'm starting to see that there is some national support for getting broadband to, especially exactly. to some of the rural areas. So there can be more connections. We on started there. to work with um, our community libraries because they have gotten some grants and they have Wi-Fi, they're handicapped accessible. So hopefully we'll be creating some pods at the area libraries. So, you know, library assistance and is there to help them if they don't figure out, you know, the Zoom or whatever. So I, it's gonna take some time for that. But yeah, I'm in, a, I'm, I'm in Wisconsin and part of me, part of our county is very connected and everybody has all the resources. And then you get into the rural parts and it's, it's just not there yet. So it's something that county government is approaching as well. So it's, it's kind of a policy issue of, you know, when the first telephones came into play <laughs> and electricity came into the United States, well, now it's the Wi-Fi. So, but great information today. This was very helpful. I'm working on my plan of work and this will be very helpful for that. So thank you. Thank you. you. Before we get into any other questions, I um, want to remind you to fill out our uh, survey for our NCRAN team here. And I've got the website uh, posted on there in the chat box and I'll, I'll post it again. Um, and we'd appreciate you uh, filling this out so it provides us some information especially for topics for uh, future webinars for you is there anyone else got another thank you here in the chat box any other questions I was going to say Jasmine a lot of what you were talking about reminded me made me start thinking 
um, I need to do more. I'm in a faith sharing group. And one of the other ladies is a caregiver for her mother uh, who has Alzheimer's and is in pretty bad condition, you know, of, yeah. of function. And, you know, she really wants to get out and do things, but um, it's hard because her mother needs that 24 seven constant care. Um, but one of the benefits of the pandemic is she's continued to be in our face sharing group and participate because we've been doing it by Zoom. So it's really helped her stay connected. And I was thinking so much about her when you were talking about this is like, wow, I really need to be a little bit more supportive, even though I don't know her that well, but need to reach out to, to be that non-kin support and do that uplifting that you were, that you were mentioning. I did have a question on slide 21 where you were showing all the little graphics uh, that had the red and yellow with the kinship connections. And yeah. I was, and I was just wondering, did all the red dots, did, um, did that mean those people had Alzheimer's or those were just the connections? Oh. Cause I oh, right saw, yes. Um, no, that did not, that meant that they had a family history of Alzheimer's. So at least so all of these people have um, the one family member that they are caring for. Um, that's how they. That's how we measured, or uh, that's how they became eligible to participate in the study. Um, but that family history was indicated by having an additional relative um, who had who had a diagnosis of Alzheimer's. So yeah, the the red are um, people who are at risk for Alzheimer's based on their family history. Okay, that's what I thought you said, but then I guess I was confusing it in my mind because the second one going from the left to the right and the top had the red and the orange and on the very bottom left is like, okay, well, <laughs> I yeah. was starting to, and then there's one about in the middle on the top row that had the combination of the red and orange. So, and on the far right. So it was like, I was starting to confuse myself from what you said. So I just wanted to, yeah, I'll to clarify. Thank, <laughs> that's really good feedback, actually. I'll make sure to clarify that in, when I present this in the future. Okay. Um, yeah, what, I thought I understood it. And then when I started, it was interesting to see all the, the connections. I was like, but wait a minute, there's red and orange in some of these connections. Yeah, yeah I mean, depending on... Um, the relationship of the care, uh, sorry, caregivers to the care recipient. You know, not all of them are biological relatives of the care recipient. So if, if it was like the um, daughter-in-law of okay. someone, um, that, that caregiver, that daughter-in-law might not have any other family history. So, um, so the family history was really at the caregiver level. Okay, that, rather than family level, which explains the mixing of colors in each okay. family. But I do, I do understand. Yeah, that is confusing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That that um, clarifies it completely. Uh, it was just interesting to see all these diagrams. It's great. Any other questions? I don't see any other questions in the chat box. Okay, once again, before we close for the day, I want to say thank you very much, Dr. Manalel, for this very informative and very interesting presentation. Um, and then for all the participants today, make sure you fill out the survey. We don't have for NCRAN, it's the first Friday of each month that we do these professional development webinars. Right now, we don't have one. Uh, set for July 9th. Um, and I know we were in discussion about that.